Hello everyone, and welcome to week 10 of English 121. This week we're going to be talking about words and how they're used in poems. Let's start by talking about the concept of words. Words are like building blocks of poetry. They're the most important part of a poem. And there's a great quote in the beginning of um, our chapter this week um, from Mother May when he's talking to Baudelaire about um, how Baudelaire was really upset about um, how to make a poem because um, he didn't have any great ideas. And Mallarmé really um, summed it up quite clearly by saying, you can't make a poem with ideas, you make it with words. So think of words as really the building block of poetry. They can be very simple, they can be very complex, but there, what we look at, we look at first as a way to understand a poem. Words have all kinds of um, de denotations and connotations. Um, the denotations are the exact dictionary definitions. If you look up the word um, poetry in the dictionary, it will give you a definition for poetry. Connotations are all of the things we think about in association with poetry. Um, if you look at a very simple poem like the one that's written here, um, this is by William Carlos Williams, and there's a picture of William Carlos Williams right here in the bottom of the page, right uh, next to the puzzle. It's, it's called, This is Just to Say. I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox, and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were delicious so sweet and so cold. Now on the surface this poem sounds so exquisitely simple, right? It's almost like you don't trust that it's just about how sweet and delicious cold plums are. But that is what this poem is about. And even though it's about something simple, it's also amazingly beautiful. Um, and sometimes when we look at a poem, we don't need to look for, you know, how this poem is about um, the, how to solve world peace, right? It's, it's just about some plums. It's about a communication between a man and a woman, right? And um, the, uh, the idea of, um, of, uh, of, of how sweet and cold plums are. Um, everything doesn't have to be a puzzle. That's not to say that when you look at a poem, that you shouldn't be looking for deeper meanings. Um, but this poem on the surface is beautiful, even with the basic um, uncomplicated um, language that it's using. Now, there's two different types of words that people use in poetry um, that we actually use in our lives, right? And diction is, is the, the conscious choice you make as to um, which words you will be using in your poem, okay? Um, abstract words are words like beauty, love, time, truth, sadness, and happiness. These are words that they're universal, right? We all experience beauty, but beauty is different to you than it is to me, right? We all have a different um, perception of what beauty is. Ironically, the more specific someone is when they write about beauty, the more universal it becomes for those reading the, the image. So for example, if you were going to talk about um, a concrete image for beauty, you could talk about daffodils, um, or the first spring daffodils, or yellow daffodils that gaggle in the sun, right? Or that sway in the sun. That gives you a beautiful image um, that that you can see in your mind um, that's concrete. Um, so maybe a symbol for love for some people might be a warm arm around my waist or a warm hand on my waist. Um, time could be the map of wrinkles that spider across her squinted eyes. Sadness or truth could be a white flag flapping in the wind. You can see how these images give a specific concrete idea to an abstract thought. Good poetry goes in fear of abstractions, as Ezra Pound says. You may remember Ezra Pound from last week when we were talking about in the station of the metro. Um, there's a, there was a picture of him screaming in the last lecture. 
so he his idea is that um, good poetry doesn't talk about ab doesn't talk in abstractions it uses concrete images um, and as William Carlos Williams the guy who wrote about the plums right he says no ideas but in things right in concrete things now when you're when you're reading poetry the most important tool you can use is a dictionary um, and when you use a dictionary to read poetry, you don't just look up the definition, but you also look up the history of the word. How was this word used when the poem was written? What are all the meanings of the word? Um, where, what's the etymology of the word, meaning the, um, where does the word come from? Is it, of a, gra is it a Latin root or a Greek root? Um, and um, what, it, what was the original meaning of that? So what I'd like you to do is practice using a dictionary to read a poem. There's two poems um, found in this chapter. Um, one is Aftermath by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and the other one is Mockingbird by Kay Ryan. So please read these two poems and think about the following questions. When, when you read after, Aftermath, talk about how the etymology and meaning of the word aftermath helps explain the poem um, and what is uh, look up the meanings of fledged and Rowan um, to and tell us what they mean um, in the in the actual poem itself um, then um, look at the word the, the poem mockingbird um, and think about what is the origin of the mockingbird's name what does it tell us about the bird's song look up pastiche brio and capriccio in the dictionary what are the musical terms add to the poem? And then finally, what is Ryan's attitude toward the Mockingbird? What do you decipher from reading the poem that her attitude is about this poem? And before you do this, I'm just going to read these two poems to you quickly. Aftermath, and it's on page 721. When the summer fields are mown, when the birds are fledged and flown, and the dry leaves strew the path. With the falling of the snow, with the cawing of the crow, once again the fields we mow and gather in the aftermath. Not the sweet new grass with flowers in this harvesting of ours, not the upland clover bloom, but the rowan mixed with weeds, tangled tufts from marsh and meads where the poppy drops its seeds in the silence and the gloom. So think about the definitions and tell me what they tell you about the meaning of this poem. The second poem is Mockingbird by Kay Ryan. Nothing whole is so bold we sense. Nothing not cracked is so exact and of a piece. Here's the distempered emperor of parts the king of patch, the master of pastiche, who so hashes other birds' laments, so minces their capriccios that the dazzle of dispatch displaces the originals. As though Brio really does beat feeling, the way two aces beat three hearts when it's cards you're dealing. So use these words, looking them up, to talk about these two poems in our conversation. As always, please post your conversation post by um, Saturday at 11.59 p.m. And um, please respond to at least three of your peers' posts. So this week for our um, reflection journal, we're going to be thinking about another really important part of poetry and understanding poetry, and that is illusion. Illusions are any indirect reference to a person, place, or thing in a poem, and that can be fictitious, historical, or actual. So what I'd like you to do is to think about, in these poems that I'm going to be reading to you right now, I'd like you to think about from your own knowledge, and then also supplemented by a dictionary or other reference work. Um, you, can, you can look these up um, using our, our library. Um, we have reference um, databases on our library. You can Google these terms. Um, you can um, you can look for um, you can come into the library and look up these illusions, um, or you can use your own personal experience to really think them through. Um, but please look at these three poems on page 723.
The first is by J.V. Cunningham, and it's called Friend on the Scaffold Thomas More Lies Dead, and it's important that this was written in 1960. Friend on the Scaffold Thomas More Lies Dead, Who Would Not Cut the Body from the Head? The second is by Samuel Minash, and it was published in 1985. Bread, thy will be done by crust and crumb, and loaves left over, the sea is swollen, with the bread I throw upon the water. And finally, Carl Sandburg's Grass. Pile the bodies high at Austerlitz and Waterloo, shovel them under and let me work, I am the grass, I cover all and pile them high at Gettysburg, and pile them high at Ypres and Verdun, shuffle them under and let me work. Two years, ten years, and passengers ask the conductor, what place is this? Where are we now? I am the grass. Let me work. So look at these poems. Use the questions found on page 723 to help you answer um, what allusions are in these poems and what the allusions mean, what the poems mean based on these allusions. This will be a reflection for this week. All right, guys, that is it for this week. Next week, you're, I'm going to be introducing your poetry writing assignment. Please make sure that um, you do revise your fiction papers so you can get your 10 points extra credit um, or the 10 points added to your revision. Um, I would love to see your revisions, um, and as always, if you have any questions, please reach out and let me know. I look forward to seeing you online.